in your introduction to your book, Land of Truth, you discuss the relationship between Agadot and the modern reader. You feel strongly about the benefit of learning Agadot and tradition in order to reorder the life of contemporary Jews. Can you elaborate on this idea? Yeah, well, you know, I mean, Agadot are really the way the rabbis talk about everything that's important in some of those larger questions. Um, the Talmud is full of halakha, and of course, halakha is, is central to Judaism, but halakha doesn't answer kind of those meta questions. You can know every detail about how to observe Shabbat or exactly what you're supposed to say in each of the daily liturgies, but, but that doesn't tell you why you're observing Shabbat or what kind of person all these halachot that you're, um, that you're trying to fulfill are supposed to make you into or even the place of, of uh, a human being in the world. Uh, all those larger questions are addressed and answered by Agadah, by stories. Um, there's a very famous Rashi that, that you might know, the first Rashi on the Torah, the great commentator Rashi, he asks, why does the Torah begin with the story of the creation of the world? Why doesn't it start in Exodus 12? That's where you get the first laws in the context of Yitziat Mitzrayim, going out of Egypt, and you have the laws of Pesach. And Rashi's saying, like, here we know halakha is so important, so, so why, why do I need all these stories about Avraham and about the creation and Yaakov, I mean, Jacob? You know, start with halakha, start with what's uh, crucially important. Rashi gives a certain answer, and I think it has a little more to do with the medieval context, but Rashi's question here is, is fundamental. Why does the Torah start with a whole book of Genesis, which is stories and even has all these stories throughout it? And, and the real answer is because you have to understand why observing any of the laws of the Torah makes sense. I mean, why should we engage in, 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 in this behavior? And it has to do in the Torah with the fact that God took us out of Egypt and saved us from bondage and gave us the Torah you know, to achieve certain purposes, make human beings holy. Um, but it, I think it's really the same thing for the Talmud. The Talmud doesn't have a meta-narrative in the way the Torah does, a sort of sequential narrative starting at creation and going through generation by generation. It has kind of fragmented stories, many, many hundreds, maybe thousands of stories that, that are interspersed throughout all the halachot in every tractate. But they really address those larger questions. What are we doing when we observe all these laws? Why should we be observing all these laws? Um, and what ends are we trying to achieve? How does it ultimately make life meaningful? How do we go from where we are to some ideal in the future? What are we aiming for? What are the values that will lead to a uh, meaningful and important life? Um, you know, um, uh, Harold Kushner, in one of his books, you know, very popular audience, he has a great line that I think about a lot. He says, people aren't afraid of dying. They're afraid of not really having lived. They're, they're afraid of their lives not really being meaningful. And, and I think this is one of the big problems. You know, I'm not, it's not my idea. I mean, sort of everybody knows this at some level. In modern society, in small traditional communities, you lived with extended families, right? You had a sense of rootedness, you were connected to your ancestors, you were connected to your family, you were connected to the community. There were certain endeavors everyone was trying to accomplish together, help each other. When people suffered, there were other people there to, to rely on. And, and in the modern world, we've lost that, um, that rootedness. Um, we're in this multicultural uh, multi-ethnic, multi-religion, multi-ethnic environment. We're bombarded with different ideas and values and narratives. I mean, we just don't have a sense of what is our personal story. Where do we come from and where are we trying to go and what are we trying to achieve in life and what will make that meaningful? And that's really what many of these stories in the Talmud are trying to answer. So what I was suggesting there in, in, um, in that introduction is um, some of these stories can really help us answer some of those those larger questions. That's that's exactly what they're 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 trying to do for the rabbis. So clearly, I'm I'm talking about this for a Jewish audience. I mean, for those who have some connection to Jewish tradition, but again, are are in this complex, secular, multicultural world of which their Jewish identity is is just one part of it. Um, 
but I think this can can lead to um, you know people finding more meaning and finding a path to negotiate this this life by turning to these stories. Look, the stories, I mean, they were passed down from generation to generation. And although the the Talmud is a vast literature. Um, we have to believe that over the course of hundreds of years, we only have a fraction of the Torah that was produced, that the stories were told, that were told of the legal discussions that the rabbis engaged in. You know, what was passed down was really only the best stuff. It was preserved over the course of generations and centuries because every generation who encountered it found it meaningful and or found it inspirational, found it something that could teach them lessons um, for living. The stuff that wasn't that good, I don't think that was passed down. It just wasn't preserved or transmitted because it wasn't found meaningful. So, you know, just we all negotiate the problems of respecting parents, our obligation to parents, especially as they age, um, sacrificing our own life or well being to take care of parents when they become increasingly infirm, when they put certain demands on us. You know, you have great stories in the Talmud about something like that. Many stories, in fact, just rabbis, other people. This is a this is a problem that that every generation was was dealing with, and I think that's one example, you know, just a trivial example, where you know this will help us can help us deal with that that particular uh, issue. So I, I think that uh, that Talmudic stories, not all of them, because some of them do address very specific issues from ages past, the very specific issues that the rabbis dealt with, but at least some of them. Uh, deal with these enduring problems of, of, of just being a human, <laughs> you know, certainly being a Jew, you know, and, um, and, and our, our resource that's not really appreciated. And part of the reason they're not appreciated is that people didn't really know how to study them or, or didn't bother studying them uh, the way they really should have been studied and understood in this, in this didactic way. And not, as you mentioned, Ben, as a kind of hagiographic, these are the great rabbis, we can never aspire to their, their level of uh, uh, holiness. So, you know, this is, I don't want to say this is the only way to find meaning in life, certainly not. I mean, lots of people find meaning in different ways, but for those who are looking for a kind of grounding and a kind of narrative to help them sort of uh, figure out where they're going from and where they're going to, I, I think uh, Talmudic stories can, Agatic stories really help. There's no doubt that these are timeless stories that every generation can benefit from, even ours, like you said in the introduction. I highly recommend to everyone listening to, to read Land of Truth. Um, but there is, you know, the, the issue that I have is that most people aren't learning it with the proper methodology. So they're going to end up, especially the modern reader, with the kind of reverse uh message that was intended so yeah. are they better off not learning them um at all and, and further kind of distancing themselves from the truth or should they obviously you know should we ch obviously we have to maybe approach the teaching the the education this the the way we're kind of passing on the methodology maybe we need to like rethink how we're how we're educating the the youth yeah no i mean you're 100 percent right you know i i, I think um I mean, I think it is, <laughs> I don't want to answer that question because uh, is it best not to study them or study them the wrong way? It's best to study them the right way. <laughs> so right. Exactly. that's, that's yeah. what we should yes. try to do. And that's, we as scholars, I uh, mean, academics, I think we have a responsibility to try to get this message out. And that was one of the things I was trying to do in my book, Land of Truth, and in another book I have called Rabbinic Stories that also provides translations and introductions to stories. But we clearly haven't done uh, a, a, a good enough job yet. Uh, I do see that it has started to percolate down, you know, in some circles, traditional uh, cir circles and, you know, um, modern Orthodox educators of various sorts have started reading some of the scholarship, not just mine. I mean, there are many scholars who work in this area that have produced great articles and great books. And some of them is, is, is trickling down into the popular culture. Just general readers who like to read materials of Jewish interest are, are, are buying these books and are reading these books. I get emails all the time from readers, uh, you know, regular people have picked up a scholarly book and have, have some question or, or, or uh, you know, express their, 
their appreciation that they now understand these these stories in, in a way they hadn't before. But we definitely have to do a better job in popularizing this scholarship and this way of reading. And um, um, so I haven't I haven't quite figured out how to do that. And you know, uh, you know, academic colleagues they have certain incentives to re to to write for a very specific audience to publish in certain journals to write books for a scholarly audience. That's how they are promoted. That's how they're rewarded. They're not really incentivized to, to write for a popular audience, although some do, and some do it very well, but it, it would be better to find ways to, to popularize this kind of uh, scholarship. I mean, I, I, I find people who read scholarly articles, scholarly books, or some of the popular books that have been written really appreciate it. I mean, maybe like you guys <laughs> are a good example. <laughs> Um, so we got to do more of that. You're right. Professor, have you ever heard of Ruth Calderon? Yeah, so Ruth Calderon is one who has been doing this in Israel. Ruth Calderon actually wrote her PhD with me. Oh, so I, I know her very well. She, she was working on it at Hebrew University, but she didn't have anybody who could really help her in the department at that time. They had some retirements or whatever, people who didn't, weren't working on stories. And she actually spent three years in New Jersey. Her husband at the time was there at a certain job. So, uh, and I teach at New York University. So she would come and meet with me uh, and wrote the dissertation with me. But she is obviously, she'd been involved in this project before trying to popularize Talmud and popularize stories and really does it in an exemplary way. Um, so she's, she's one who's been, been working in this, in this uh, field for sure. Right, she, sure. she gave that speech to the Knesset where she was using yes. Talmudic stories as a like didactic lessons for the Knesset. And it just yeah. when you were talking about what you were talking about, it just popped into my head that that's exactly like, that's like, oh, sorry about that. Um, that's exactly what you were saying, how she was actually taking Talmudic stories and trying to actually inform like the Knesset through those stories. Less yeah, that was a great example of it. Yeah, and it went viral, and she actually, this people started participating, and she started talking about how the lesson from that, you know, one Talmudic story is that we have to include other people and open yep. the Beit Midrash. Uh, but that was just that was just one lesson that uh, it, it should be done much more for sure, for sure. Yeah. And also, um, the popular book, The Sages, by Rabbi Lau, that kind of also got us even more interested in this subject because we were like, wow, you really. Like by humanizing them and putting in a historic, like I, I guess you don't, you were mentioning the historical cons, uh, um, part of it, but that the fact that he did that, he kind of made us see things in a different light. We never actually appreciated the rabbis that way. So I, I feel like you guys are doing God's work. Yeah, yeah, we're trying. You know, we're trying. As they say, you know. There's a lot of work to do and life is short, but yeah, but we should do more of it. Yes.